Well, here we are. Day one of the coronavirus self-quarantine. Not much to do. It's really rainy outside. My dog is here looking at me. What should we do? Charlie, what should we do? What do you think? Should we watch some, some musicals? Does that sound like a good idea? Musical TV episodes. They should be like a genre onto themselves, right? It's been this thing for like the past, I don't know, 25, 30 years that if you've got a show that's sci-fi or any level of camp, that they have to do a musical episode. Or maybe it's just a TV show where things have gone a little stagnant. Or maybe you've got some musical theater people in your cast and you want to show them off. There are a myriad of reasons why the musical episode of a non-musical TV show exists. And there are a lot of them. So since we're all hunkering down, you know, we're all in our pajamas with full faces of makeup, I thought it would be fun to watch and review some musical episodes of non-musical TV shows. So we have a few rules. First rule is only one musical episode per series. So like shows like The Simpsons have a lot of musical episodes, so I'm gonna just pick one. And I'm just gonna pick the one I want because whatever, it's my review. The other rule is that it must be a proper musical episode. So no, you know, if the episode is mostly a normal episode and then all of a sudden there's a musical number, that doesn't count. So I think there was an episode of How I Met Your Mother that did that. Doesn't count. It's gotta be using music to tell the story. I'm also gonna limit this to the past 25 years because I don't know, if I go farther back than that, no one's gonna watch this video. So let's say like the late 90s till now. You're just gonna see Charlie appearing every once in a while too, so deal with it, he's a good dog. So I picked 20 TV shows and I put them into a hat, into my lucky bowler hat. I don't know, I might do like five per video, uh, we're gonna see how this goes. So I'm just gonna pick one at random. I guess I should mention before I start too that I've seen some of these TV shows and some of these episodes, but there's a lot that I haven't seen. And there's a lot of TV shows on this list that I don't watch. So part of the fun is gonna be trying to discover what's going on in these shows uh, through song. So who's it gonna be? Who's it gonna be? Wait, it feels like two, hold on. Just one, okay. Okay. Okay, the first one is... <laughs> it's Oz. <laughs> so, I've never seen Oz. I know about it. Um, <laughs> I know that it takes place in a prison and it's a very dark show. I know that um, Chris Maloney was on it and I know that J.K. Simmons was on it. So I'm gonna watch the Oz musical episode, and that episode is called Variety. So uh, we'll see you back on the other side. This is the last duet, last chance to go again. No more harmony for you and me. Okay, so I just watched uh, Oz. So this was season five, which is in 2002, and the episode is called Variety. Uh, this show talks about rape a lot. <laughs> okay, so Oz. I'd never seen this show. Um, I really like the theme song. Uh, very of its time. <laughs> Very like those like kind of early days of HBO television. Look how edgy we are. Um, but I was watching the theme song and I was like, how is this gonna translate? It kind of doesn't. It's basically what I assume is, is um, a standard Oz episode. This show has a lot of plot that happens in one episode. It really happens really fast. Like 
gives Game of Thrones a run for their money. Right, Charlie? Right? Did you like Oz? Did you like Oz? He didn't like it. In the first five minutes, I saw B.D. Wong, Rita Moreno, J.K. Simmons, and Betty Buckley. So I was like, shit, okay, here we go. The musical numbers all are solos, except for one duet, and they all take place in a glass box that are meant to emulate the cells, because the cells on Oz are all glass and see-through. I guess they all relate to what's going on in the story, but it doesn't really like connect to the story at all. Comments on it, like in Limbo, kind of the way Cabaret does, for example. Um, half of the songs in Cabaret take place, you know, during the actual plot, but the other half take place in this like Limbo space, the Kit Kat Club. So that's kind of what it felt like, like Oz's version of the Kit Kat Club. There, w there was one song that took place during like the variety show, but the rest are all in this glass box and all would have these characters singing their songs in it. Um, Rita Moreno sings first, which is nice. Give me Rita Moreno singing all the time. Um, and she's singing directly to the camera as they all do. Then there was like a white power guy in a box singing really badly. There was like a grizzled, a grizzled man with a beard who was singing in the box about Vietnam and like spray painting on it. I like that guy. I don't, I don't remember his name, but I liked him. Uh, B.D. Wong, so B.D. Wong gets to sing too. So Rita Moreno and B.D. Wong, the, the people with Broadway credits, they get to sing. Um, Betty Buckley, Betty freaking Buckley doesn't sing a song. Feels like a waste of your Betty Buckley. You had her right there. No Meadowlark? Okay, whatever. B.D. Wong's was the most fabulous. He got to sing a song in the box with a head mic. He was like a leather daddy priest. The best number though was J.K. Simmons and this other guy singing the last duet in a box. And it was fun and they were harmonizing. You actually got to see some characters interacting whilst they sang. And of course, J.K. Simmons got his start on Broadway. He was in the 90s revival of uh, Guys and Dolls, so it's really fun to watch him sing. I guess this show does like flashbacks for how the person got in jail when they make their first appearance. So they had two different characters doing that in this episode, so I'm curious if there's just a rotating door of guys who come in on this show. There is a lot of talk about rape on this show, and a lot of just rape in general. Um, but Chris Maloney, he, he's in love with a guy, and they have like, they're actually in love. Um, so that was, that was nice. There is literally a part where Ernie Hudson like sits back in his chair and he's like, this is different. This is Oz. And I was like, that had to be played in a, in a bunch of different trailers for that season. Overall, I don't think this is a very effective musical episode. Um, it's all very, it doesn't, it just feels like a normal episode of Oz and they kind of shoehorned these musical numbers in after the fact and I don't really know why. Also just all these gangs talking about you gotta take out this guy, you gotta take every two seconds they're like incapacitate him for me. And I was like I could not keep track of who they were and I thought the songs would help me out but the thing is they only did songs for a few of the characters um, and they would do them before I had met the characters so it kind of meant nothing to me that they were singing it. Um, like Rita Moreno starts the episode and I like Rita Moreno, but I don't really know her nun character. By the end of the episode, I, I, I liked her a lot. I don't know if I'd recommend this one, especially if you're not a fan of, um, shows like this or if you haven't seen Oz. Ah, I touched my face! Here we go. Time for the next one. Charlie, you want to pick? Okay. Our next TV series is, ooh, it's always, it's probably really blurry. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. I've heard that there are two musical episodes of this show. I'm not quite sure which one I'm gonna watch. So I'm gonna research them and I'm gonna get back to you. I, I've seen um, a few scattered episodes of It's Always Sunny. Um, I, I haven't, I've never like binged it or watched every episode, but I've seen a few here and there and I, I like the characters, I like the conceit of it. Let's see which one we're gonna watch, okay baby boy? I think he's ready. Day man, oh, fighter of the night man, oh, champion of the sun, oh, you're a master of karate and friendship for everyone. Okay, 
so I decided to go with uh, season four, The Nightman Cometh. Uh, I had some people recommend that to me. Also, apparently, um, they did the show. The show has been done on stage. Um, I was reading about that online a little bit. Sorry, there's someone in the kitchen banging things. We're all living in this house right now. I don't know how I ended up watching two musical episodes where rape is such a heavy theme. But I, I thought it was funny. Uh, you know, I really like the characters and I like the chemistry. And, um, you know, you can't go wrong with kind of show within a show. Uh, when it comes to musical episodes, there's an excuse in the story for them to do it. Um, and more than half the episode was them doing the musical, so I feel like it counts. There were some elements that I thought that were really relatable, like the stage manager being named after a Greek goddess. That was a real thing when I was at a UC Santa Cruz right here. Also, something that I don't, <laughs> I don't think people talk about very much when they talk about <laughs> children's theater, but like the real, there's a very real thing about brothers and sisters having to be cast opposite each other. Um, I luckily have never had that problem with my brother, but um, I've seen shows where it's gotten weird. That's all I'm gonna say. I also kind of like that Caitlin Olsen has like a really like Joanna from Sweeney Todd vibrato um, singing her little tiny boy song. It's always funny to me when um, movies and TV shows do a bad musical because there's always elements to it that are really good but don't make sense. Like in Waiting for Guffman, like the orchestra is like painfully competent and in this, um, the sets were painfully competent. I was like, how did they come up with this really fantastic, I mean, it was like, you know, pretty standard, but like, it was some pretty good set design for this like, shitty group of people who don't know anything about theater. I liked that last song, Day Man, oh, he fighting the night man, oh. I thought that was fun. I feel like uh, when people don't really know anything about musicals, they, they tend to go for like cat eyes and West Side Story snaps, which is exactly what they did. But I think that was the whole point, is that these characters are awful and they don't really know anything about musicals. I also liked how in the last song, Charlie Day was doing this weird, like yodel, like head, head to chest flip, uh, <laughs> which, uh, you, if you want to hear a great example of that, Mandy Moore in Tangled. She does that the whole time. I, I can't do it because I've developed my mix so well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought it was funny. It's a funny show. Every time I kind of catch an episode, I, I always really enjoy it. And I thought it was really funny. They have such a good chemistry together and they're so awful that it's really fun to watch them. Um, Danny DeVito is a troll. You can't go wrong. That was pretty great. And, and, and I do like that. <laughs> she said stage freeze. I've, 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 I've never heard that, which I thought that was pretty funny. I think I'm gonna start incorporating that into uh, my performances, stage freeze. Okay, so that was a nice short one, thank God. So let's see. Who's gonna be number three, Charlie? Who's gonna be number three? Okay. Oh, okay. Even Stevens. So I did want to say, I didn't pick too many kids shows. I, I went on Twitter and I kind of, I didn't even ask for suggestions. I kind of just talked about it a little bit and I, was, I got a lot of suggestions. And there are quite a few children's shows that do have musical episodes. And I think it's because there's more of a blending between those genres when, you, when it comes to children's entertainment. Um, however, um, I, I kind of decided to make an exception for Even Stevens because um, I've never seen that show. I, I was just a little too old for it when it came out. Um, I'm on the older Nickelodeon MTV spectrum. I'm like the you can't do that on television, like early days of Nicktoons kind of gal. So Even Stevens was after my time. But um, some people recommended this and um, also I kind of just want to see what little Shia LaBeouf doing a musical is like. I'm gonna watch it and uh, hopefully the Disney-ness of it all won't, uh, won't rot my teeth. We went to the moon in 1969, not 1970, a year before, uh-huh. The rocket that flew had a really neat design. When it you good, Charlie? Yeah, he's good. Okay, um... I really liked this one. I can't lie here. I really liked it. Um, I think it worked so well because the music kind of moved the story 
and it told me about the characters. Um, I don't really know this show, but uh, watching this episode, I kind of got who everyone was. Um, and a lot of it was because of the songs. So this is from 2002, so there are some delightful 2002 Disney Channel uh, hairdos and wardrobe choices, so mwah, bravo on that. I do know that Christy Carlson Romano has done Broadway, and she was one of the Disney Channel stars who was like a singer, so it was good to have her doing a little musical theater on the show. Yeah, I, I liked that she was, um, she was sick with the flu, with influenza, very timely. Um, and, you know, she powers through and goes to school. Uh, spoiler, it's all a dream. Oh. <laughs> but I also didn't know that the gym teacher character wrote all the songs. His name is Jim Wise. And the songs are, they're good. I mean, it's not like Sondheim, but it's perfectly accessible, catchy, um, very clearly musical theater songs and I like the influences of some of them. I like how they kind of fake you out. Like I kind of figured she was seeing the musical numbers because she was sick. Um, so she was like loopy and hallucinating musical numbers. So I liked it from the beginning of the morning announcements with the principal doing that. Um, I loved the big jar of grease joke that was so weird. I thought that was great. So Shia LaBeouf's character, he has a song called Always Finds a Way, which told me that, you know, he always finds a way to get out of going to class, which is, I thought was great. And then there was a song called What's the Matter with Ren? She's always so brainy. What's wrong with her? It was great. It like taught me who each of these characters were, these even Stevens. I was a big fan of the uh, proto high school musical extras in the background who were always like, They were my favorite. There was a lot of proto high school musical here. Like you could feel it. It's like, ooh, it's just a few years off. I also like the character of Larry Beale, like her nemesis. I don't know if he was in any other episodes. He feels like someone they just put in for this because he has this like whole rap dance break where he's like, I'll tell you what's the matter with Ren. And he like busts out like he's the biggest like star in the world. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> he doesn't know how to sit still. Oh baby boy, he's a good boy. Oh, then there's this song, the sixth period song, which was practically like Brechtian. It wasn't even minor, it was dissonant. It was so, such an odd song to hear in a like 22 minute <laughs> episode of a Disney Channel show, but I liked it. That goes into the gym teacher who wrote the songs, BT Dubs, singing how he's the master, wait, hold on, I wrote down, master of the gym. So he has like a phantom soccer mask. So again, just like the, uh, the last episode, going for the recognizable musical theater jokes that anyone will get. Um, but then it didn't sound like phantom. It was very candor and ebb. It was very And then the, the song that made me want to die though was the, we went to the moon in 1969, just because it's so insidious. Like, I feel like that guy had that melody for years and was like, I'm going to put it on this show. Like, that is a catchy melody that's really, really annoying. But Christy Carlson Romano did some good mixing. Um, she has a nice mix. I know she was Belle on Broadway, so, like, she, she, she was good. Um, and then it was all a dream. And then it was a dream within a dream. And I gotta say, he rhymed influenza with stanza, which is warping it a little bit, but you know what? I'll allow it. I, I gotta say, I'm glad you guys recommended this one to me. I don't, you know, I'm... <laughs> I'm 30, um, oh sorry, I'm 30, so um, I don't know if I'm gonna like get into watching Even Stevens, but I'm glad I watched this episode. It was, it was really funny. Okay, here we go. Two more, two more for this video. <gasps> this is a good one. This is one I have seen. I've seen this one a lot. I have the sheet music for this episode. I'm still gonna watch it just to refresh myself. Um, I've done a staged reading of this episode where I played Anya, um, so I know it very well. So it's gonna be fun to talk about. Okay, here we go. Once more with feeling. Mm. So we will. Um, 
I could talk about this one for ages and I will because I have the sheet music. So maybe I guess it was like three years ago uh, we did like a Halloween staged reading of uh, <laughs> Once More with Feeling with my group Play Club West and it was a lot of fun. Um, I played Anya. Cody who plays Gerald uh, was um, Giles <laughs> and my husband Jeff was Spike so it was pretty great but because of that we had uh, music rehearsals and so I got the sheet music which they have the whole every single thing in the episode is in here. I love this episode so much because it's written by someone who knows musicals intimately like Joss Whedon is obviously a fan of musical theater and the tropes of musical theater. Uh, there's just like an understanding of musical theater throughout. Um, silly little things like he swell, she sweller, he'll always be my feller. Like feller is such a golden age of musical Rodgers and Hammerstein trope. Uh, I like that Anya is really concerned whether her duet with Xander is, what did she say? Oh, a breakaway pop hit or um, a book number or, <laughs> or like a retro pastiche, I think she says. So she's really concerned whether it's like an Angela Weber type of musical that'll like <laughs> be a hit on the radio or something that's like more from the golden age of musicals, which I think is a really funny uh, homage. Uh, because I got to work with the sheet music though, there was a lot of stuff that kind of jumped out at me. In fact, the pianist was really frustrated by it. Um, for example, like, and I'm sorry if this doesn't make any sense to you, but there's a lot of songs where instead of just writing the second verse underneath the first verse, there are just unnecessary codas everywhere, which makes it really hard for an accompanist to play. And then in the song, Something to Sing About, there's that section where it's supposed to feel like Buffy is kind of, I don't know, singing faster because she's starting to get caught up in it which she's gonna dance and dance herself to death. And it goes from four, four, and then there's a measure in seven, eight, and then there's a measure in four, four again, and then there's a measure in five, eight, and then it's back to four, four. So it doesn't, it really just feels like Joss going, no, I wanted to do this and I wanted to do this. And the arranger was like, okay. I also think that something to sing about is just like in the same place the whole time. Like there, it doesn't really build at all. And um, I don't really know why, it's really weird. It's so funny because this episode was so successful. Season six of Buffy, so this is a show that I love, obviously. I've seen every episode multiple times. Um, so season six of Buffy is very um, divisive, I suppose you could say. It's, it's a weird season, but I think because they were kind of thinking outside the box, I think some of their best moments came out of that season, even though maybe some of their worst ones came out of that season too, but once more with feeling. My housemate's dog was singing. This was really kind of, this episode came out in 2001 and it, I really think it kind of snowballed that early 2000s trend of musical TV episodes. Like, they used to be really a thing. Like, they kind of were a couple in the 90s and there are kind of some now, but like, there was that peak 10 year period where everyone was like, let's have a musical episode. And I really think Buffy started it all. Um, and it's really a beloved episode. Um, the <laughs> one and only time I've ever been to Comic Con, which is like in 2008. Uh, there was, I went to the Buffy sing-along viewing with a whole crowd of people and it was so much fun. It's clear that there are people in the cast who are singers, like Anthony Stewart Head has always been the singer. He was always doing like rock star stuff on the show, like that was the whole thing, it's like Giles can sing and play the guitar, so uh, we all knew he can sing. Um, I feel like Tara and Anya both probably did a musical in their lives, probably Xander too, maybe like a high school or college show. <laughs> Willow was like, no, I don't want to sing. <laughs> so she sings like the absolute least. <laughs> Sarah Michelle Gellar is so funny because she's like not bad, but she does this real amateur singing thing of dropping her R's. Um, so when she's doing something to sing about, there's this part where she's like, um, and we all play our parts, and then we start to start, and you can feel your heart. And I'm like, 
Sing a hard R, girl. Walk through the fire like they try to do it. She's like, fire! So you could tell she was like working with a vocal coach. Like she's not bad at all, but like you could, you could tell, you could hear the vocal coach going, okay, Sarah, like let's do this. <laughs> I love Under Your Spell. I really do like the lyrics spread beneath my willow tree. And I just, I don't know of any musical theater songs that end in cunnilingus let alone lesbian cunnilingus. I mean, maybe something from Fun Home. Uh, oh, Hinton Battle. Hinton Battle plays Sweet, the demon, and he has three Tony Awards for Best Featured Actor in a Musical, and he's amazing. I mean, he runs away with the whole episode. Every time he's on screen, you're just like, because he's singing and dancing and tapping, and oh my god, he's amazing. There's three guys in the opening number who are like demons and vampires that Buffy's killing. Um, and then there's three guys dancing with brooms in the background. And then, oh, then Sweet has three like ventriloquist dummy minions. So I think those are the same three guys. I think they just hired some dancer guys. Um, and they're great, they're wonderful. I love how there's all these dance breaks, but it's like really simple dance breaks because they're like TV actors, they're not musical theater actors. So it's a lot of like this acting, um, but it's good, it works. There's this cute part where Buffy does that, which I really like. I love I'll Never Tell. I sang that with one of my best friends when I did that reading and it's such a fun song. A lot of character, a lot of really fun stuff and it's simple harmony. I like it. I love when Spike shows up. Spike is such a great character. I love Spike. Buffy should never be with Spike, um, but it was fun when she was kind of doing it because it was bad. I, I could go off on a whole thing. But I love when he starts catching the musical theater bug and he realizes it while he's, while he's like telling her to get out and then they both kind of do this reaction but they can't stop singing. It's funny. Also, who has a funeral at night? I will say it was really funny when I saw this at Comic-Con and Dawn starts her, does anybody even notice? Does anybody even care? And the whole crowd just went, no, <laughs> everyone hates Dawn. I love Walk Through the Fire. That is such a great song. It gets me every time I get goosebumps. It's like that perfect act one finale where all the characters are like, we're gonna go do the thing that's gonna take us to act two. It's great, it's one day more. I love it, it's great. They time those fire trucks to come by right when they say burn. Also, I like how they hold off on saying burn until the last chorus. So all the verses do let it, oh, let it, and then they finally let it burn. Yeah, I, uh, I also like that Spike apparently knows the music man. 76 bloody trombones, hmm. And yeah, the ending's amazing. When I, Again, when I saw it at Comic-Con, the crowd goes wild. I love the uh, movie musical theming at the beginning and the end. It's just a, a great episode and um, you do need to kind of know a little bit, which is why the uh, previously on Buffy section is kind of important, because it is important to know that Buffy has come back from the dead recently and is going through some stuff, um, and that Willow is, you know, manipulating her girlfriend. Oh my god, it's such a good show. Anyway, so uh, this is a great episode. It's fun to talk about. Uh, okay, one more for tonight. Ugh. Let it be a short one. Let it be a short one. <gasps> that 70s show! Okay, this is gonna be a good one to end the night. This is another show that I watched off and on probably the whole time it was on. It's a good one that you, you really don't have to like watch the whole series to get it. It's a fun one. Such a great cast. I i didn't even know they did a musical episode. I had no idea. When I was looking stuff up, I saw that and I was like, well, I have to review it. Um, so this will be a good one to end the video on. So that 70s show. Here we go, man. Groovy. Mm. Okay, so this is a good time to point out that, you know, I picked 20 TV shows that had musical theater episodes or musical episodes, and I pulled them out of a hat at random. And tonight, out of the five that I've pulled, four of them have been from the millennium. Like they've been all from 2001, 2002. So this was like a thing, it was a trend. 
And this is the first thing I've watched tonight where I was like, this feels like a trend. It's clearly a group of people who don't know anything about musical theater writing a musical episode and a bunch of actors who have no interest in doing a musical doing a musical. <laughs> like they obviously don't want to do musicals and that's totally fine, but they were forced to for this TV episode. Instead of using the songs to further any character development, it's just dream sequences. Like Fez keeps turning his head around and having these fantasy sequences. Like, okay. I feel like no one wants to be doing this. So it starts with Fez ha having a dream sequence of all the characters in the jukebox uh, singing, sing, sing a song. So the songs are all 70s pop songs, which fine, it's that 70s show. I get it. And all of them are just kind of dicking around. And also Fez can't sing. Wilmer Valderrama is not a good singer, but really none of them are, which is fine. That's not a killer for these things. Not everyone in Buffy was a great singer, obviously. Um, when it comes down to pushing the, even, even Stevens, like not all of them are good singers. There were some not great singers in that group, but I was still charmed and had fun. So uh, Roger Daltrey from The Who is like the stuffy music teacher and no, oh, he's talking about his g -g generation and Fez hates him and oh, he's so stuffy and mean. Topher Grace is going through it like he hates his life. There are quite a few moments where he's like, yep, here I am. One of the best things about the musical numbers though is they cut the laugh track out, which is a godsend because the laugh track is insufferable. But they do so happy together and then for no reason, th this is a perfect example of why it's just people who don't know anything about musicals going, this is musicals, right? They put like Silver LeMay up and then give them canes. And they're dancing to So Happy Together with canes for no reason. The song isn't a song that calls for like cheesy musical theater canes. Also like there are actually like very few instances in musicals of people like dancing with canes. It's this old vaudevillian trope that doesn't really exist anymore or hold water anymore, but they just were like, sure. Like they would have been better off with like jazz hands and bowler hats, whatever. I also find it really funny that it's a 70s musical episode and like Andrew Lloyd Webber is right there. Right there. Jesus Christ superstar. Or like go for a chorus line. Like there are so many really, really famous musicals that the normies know that would be great. But instead it was like, meh. That's the problem, is the people making it didn't know anything about musicals and the people doing it were like, eh, whatever. The only song that I actually thought was good was when they did the stoner circle, which they always do on the show. Um, and they did the Joker, which I thought was great because, because that's actually what they do on the show. They do the stoner circle all the time. So it was cool to see them go around and kind of singing in their own voices this song that everyone knows and you know, it was really cute and they had some like armography from above. Like I thought that was actually pretty clever, but like kind of that's where it ended. <laughs> Laura Prepon and Mila Kunis really did not want to sing. They do love hurts and they let Topher Grace and Ashton Kutcher scream through it. And then they dub Laura Prepon with this operatic soprano and Mila Kunis with this like belting riffer. So sure. And then they waste a full like minute on this montage of them TPing Roger Daltrey's house. Is that a musical? I don't know. I, these people don't know what a musical is. And they end with a shake your groove thing, which is really funny because like none of them are singing in it. It's obviously just like some chorus that they recorded in the studio that's doing it and that's it. So it's fine. You know, there's definitely way better episodes of that 70s show. I don't hate that 70s show. I actually really like that 70s show. But um, them trying to do a musical really kind of fell flat. I also just felt like it was a wasted opportunity. There was a lot they could have done with it, um, considering <laughs> how many iconic 70s musicals there are. Like, I can't believe they just, they were so close with the canes. If they replaced those with top hats, it would have, they have the LeMay background. It could have been a chorus line. Mm. So, oh my gosh, I've been doing this for hours. 
So I have 15 episodes left, so I'll try to churn these out over my next few boring weeks. My dog's been farting a lot, so I think it's time to go to bed. Adieu, my darling social distancers. <laughs>